and believe that phlebology knows no geographical boundaries, but we all try to learn from each other how does one do the management of venous disease in their place and give us little tips and tricks. So this evening's program is sponsored by Servie, and it's an international pharmaceutical group governed by a non-profit foundation. And what does it support? It supports brands produced in India, though it's an international company, Servier is the international counterpart. And we do not use any active pharmacy, they do not use any active pharmaceutical ingredient from China and everything is, is made from France. And thank you all healthcare professionals when the supply chain and pharmacies in these specially challenging and difficult times against with COVID. The problem is that we are all now realizing that COVID is not going to go away easily. And all we can do is just be careful and help out each other in social distancing. And that's the town hall or whatever, uh, you know, the We Move, Venus Movement, Facebook page of Serbia. And these are all our leaders present on there. And I welcome everybody today to our program. That's the town hall. And so let me introduce, that's Dr. Dekiwadia's program that was there. So I will now introduce Dr. Dedi Pratama. <clears throat> Dr. Dedi, can you can you come on the screen, please? Please make Dr. Dedi's screen active. Make it make it the uh, yeah. So, Dr. Dedi, if you can just raise your hand like that, so everybody knows that this is yes. That's Dr. Dedi Prathama, okay. and he's a consultant vascular surgeon at Dr. Sipto Mangun Kusumo National Central General Hospital. Hello. And it's an 800-bed academic hospital in Jakarta. Now, that's a huge place. And it's the main teaching hospital and is affiliate of the Faculty of Medical University of Indonesia. And he's the chairman of the Indonesian Society of Vascular and Endovascular Society, as well as the Indonesian Venus Forum. That's a good, good uh, combination of societies to have. So you have a lot of synergies. And from the, I will introduce the, uh, the speaker from India, and that's Dr. Harinder Bedi. Dr. Harinder Bedi is a cardiothoracic vascular surgeon. He has a uh, deep interest into uh, non-medical things too, which you will gradually find out over time. He has these lovely little pictures that he posts of the flowers or the little fruits that he sees in his garden every morning. And that is another hobby of his, which we all love to watch. And Dr. Bedi is in Chandigarh, and uh, he used to be in Ludhiana at uh, Christian Medical College and has just moved there. So that's Dr. Bedi. And uh, our other panelists are Dr. Roy Burgess, the current or just, um, uh, you know, the president of the Venus Association of India, and we'll be having a changeover pretty soon. And he's in down south in Kerala. And our other panelist is Dr. Rahul Jindal, who's been from Mohali. He's the director of vascular surgery there. And uh, and Dr. Rahul, of course, uh, has a deep interest into everything that has to do with the vascular system. So I hand it over to Dr. Devi Pratama. Dr. Devi, can you please unmute yourself and then we go ahead and please introduce the Indonesian panelist and speaker and have the honor of going first. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Maila Patel. Hello, good evening to all, to all my doctor colleagues. I hope everyone is now at the good condition, even though we should be going through this pandemic of COVID-19, which occurring in entire world. But I'm glad that we are still be able to hold this webinar with the topic of winner on venous disease. John Venus Association of Indian Indonesian Society for Vascular and Endovascular Surgery. 
Then I am approached to introduce three of my colleagues from Indonesia. First, I have uh, to introduce Dr. Yuan Sun Kosama. is a consultant vascular surgeon at Professor Dr. Kando Central General Hospital Manado and North Celebes, Indonesia. And he also being a lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Samratulangi. And where the other two panelists are, one, Dr. Patrianev, please. Dr. Patrianev is a consultant a vascular surgeon at Dr. Cipto Mangun Kusuma National Central General Hospital too in Jakarta at several other private hospitals. He also currently active as a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine Universitas Indonesia. And the last one, Dr. Ahmadu PhD. Next, Dr. Ahmadu. Hello. Is a consultant vascular surgeon at Dr. Cipto Mangun Kusuma too in Jakarta and several other private hospitals. And he also active as a lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia. Furthermore, I will be giving the chance to Dr. Malapata to introduce the other to continue. Okay, please Dr. Malapata. Uh, Dr. Malay, sir, uh, please unmute. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dedi Pratama. Dedi, thank you for that uh, introduction of the Indonesian uh, team that you have put together. That's a, that's a fantastic team that you have put together. And Dr. Bedi, the web is now yours. The web space, the web cyber world is yours. Please, it's... Uh, the podium, and you can. Uh, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, uh, I, I, I missed that. Uh, uh, Dr. Bedi will be our speaker, but uh, um, Dr. Pratama, uh, the podium is now for the Indonesian speaker. Okay. I, I, sorry, sorry for the lapse. Yeah. Next. Uh, okay. Next, welcome to Dr. Yuan Sun Kosama. He's going to share. His experience is managing chronic venous insufficiency. Li Yuan Sun, the floor is yours. You have 50 minutes for your presentation. Please, Dr. Yuan Sun. Oh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity given to me to speak on this symposium. For all my teachers, Dr. Dedi, Dr. Patrianik, and Dr. Amadu, with all the seniors. So I would like to share our experience here in Manado North Celebes to manage the CVI. As we know, Indonesia is an archipelago, and our hospital, I put it here in the red circle. It is located in Manado North Celebes. It's three hours flight from Jakarta as the capital city with population around two and a half million people. It's bordered by the Philippines, as you can see here, the Philippines in the north. Kando Hospital is a teaching hospital. We educate medical doctor and general surgeon here and is a referral hospital for Eastern Indonesia. Okay, that's a little introduction from Manado. And in our practice, when we diagnosing CPI, we use the CAP classification uh, as a standard report. As we can see here, the first is the clinical manifestation, and there is a revision this year for this clinical manifestation. So we have the C0 to C6 based on the clinical appearance of the patients. And after that, we will see to uh, for the etiological classification, maybe from the anamnesis, we can find it. It is a cochlear primary or secondary. And then we will uh, do a set, an assessment using an ultrasound to check for the anatomical. Um, is it a superficial 
perforating or deep veins, and then to check for the pathophysiology if there is a refract obstruction of both or both of them. After uh, we diagnosing the CVI based on the CAAP, uh, we will go with the management. The therapy is consists with the multi modality. We will start with the education, uh, the patient to elevate their legs when they rest and do exercise to stimulate the cough muscle and to increase their circulation with the hope of course to reduce the swelling and improve the return of blood to the heart. And uh, another modality that is uh, important too is we do a compression to the patient. And then we will consider to give some drugs to the patients and the physiotherapy. And in uh, another stage, uh, we will do a sclerotherapy, phlebectomy, or surgery to the patient, to our patients. Uh, this is maybe the highlight of the management modalities that usually we do. Uh, for the phlebotropic drugs, it can be used from the C0 to C6. And for the sclerotherapy, we usually use it in the C1 and C2 condition. Still lesser therapy for the C1. For all the stages, we can use a compression therapy. Topical treatment, we can use in the C0, C0 uh, like to moist the excessive dry skin. Uh, because it can help to reduce the fissuring and skin breakdown. And the uh, topical steroid too for uh, the stasis dermatitis. And in the condition of the ulcer, uh, we can put the antibiotic uh, topical treatment. And sometimes we use the sting too, sting uh, for the topical treatment. And for the from the C2 to C6, uh, we consider to do a surgery. The CPI problem in Indonesia. Uh, what we have here first is, it is a low public awareness and poor screening. The second one is CPI is often overlooked by healthcare providers because of an underappreciation, I think, of the magnitude and impact of the problem. So usually the primary health facilities do not refer the case of CPI. As the result, patients usually come to us with an advanced stage. Another problem in Indonesia is medical stocking is quite expensive and not covered by national insurance. The other problem is phlebotropic is categorized as the vitamin. So it is not covered too by the national insurance. And not all the insurance covers the minimal invasive therapy of CPI. Uh, this is the recapitulation of our surgery in Manado. I took it for the last three years, uh, but in 2020, the elective operation is reduced because of COVID. Yeah, we do some stripping. Uh, put a seal, RFA, and EVLA to the patient. And the report, we have uh, two complications with hematome when we do stripping and one patient with infection. And in NBCA, there is one not sealed well and there is a reference there. So I will show you some of our works to manage the CPI in Indonesia. This is the first case. This is the male, 56 years old. It is C3 to 6 with the etiology of primary anatomical is the superficial and caused by the reflux. With the fitness treating together with the high ligation to this patient, as you can see the ulcer here after do the treating, one month follow up here, the ulcer start to heal. And in the two months, the ulcer healed completely. And as you can see here, as I said before, that we have a problem to put the compression stocking to uh, 
some patients because it is not covered by the national insurance. So as you can see here on uh, this side, we have the elastic bandage and we, see, we usually use it to change the medical compression stocking. We do the compression using an elastic bandage. Another case is female, 56 years old with C2. We do a stripping and multiple flabectomy, the patient, and it comes with a good result. Another case, female, 58 years old with C2. We do two uh, phenol stripping and multiple flabectomy here. And the result is as expected. Another case here, there is a female 60 years old with K with C, C3, 4B, and 6R. But uh, this patient has a post-traumatic syndrome too. Uh, it has a BMI, the obese, and we do a stripping on this patient. And for this patient, we, after the surgery, we put him in, a, we put her in a compression stocking and uh, we still do a follow-up for this patient because we still, uh, we just did the surgery to her. Another case is male, 43 years old. We do a fenestropping, stripping and flabectomy too. Came with a good result here. Another case, uh, it is a female, 68 years old, C2 to 5. We do a phenol stripping on this patient. And as you can see here, uh, the vein is quite turtles. And when we do the stripping, uh, we found it hard to uh, put the wire through from the ankle to the wire and from the ankle to the groin. So we do uh, like a multiple incision to the stripping and it comes segmented for the GSP. And because inside uh, our GSP, there's a thrombus too there. So the wire cannot go through. So we have to cut uh, in multiple places on this patient from ankle to the groin. Uh, another problem is we have a complication with this patient because uh, she refuses to use the compression, uh, the compression garment after that. Uh, she just use it for one day and after that, uh, she cannot stand with uh, the compression. So when uh, she came back, we uh, do an ultrasound check and we still have uh, an hematoma in this patient. <clears throat> this is a case that we do with the EFLA, male 45 years old uh, with C2. Uh, it came with a good result. Another is male, 43 years old. <clears throat> we do EFLA on this patient. <clears throat> and another is male, 45, uh, 54 years old. And on the other case, we try to do the RFA2 some patients with the radio frequency ablation. There is a male, 45 years old, with C2. He do a RFA and flabectomy to this patient. Uh, it has a good result. Uh, another case, male, 45 years old. We do flabectomy and ablation on the main vein. And another case, we use the NDCA closer system on the patient. It came with the C2, 3, 4, and 6. Um, the anatomical is superficial and deep. There is a reflux. And we do the Fiona seal. And to follow up, uh, the ulcer seal. Uh, we usually monitor after sealing with the ultrasound to see the results uh, of the glue inside. With the compression, we can check it. Okay. 
Uh, this is a comparison, a table I took from Alan Hamden report. There is a surgery versus conservative management. There is a five randomized clinical trial. And uh, they reported that at two years, surgery improved quality adjusted life years and symptoms. Surgery versus endovenous laser therapy. There is an early benefit with the endovenous laser in pain and bruising, but in cosmetic results, there is no difference. Surgery versus radiofrequency ablation. Uh, of course, the minimal invasive, it is faster to return to work, less pain, and better short term of quality of life. RFA versus endovenous laser therapy, radiofrequency ablation, report less bruising and tenderness from four RCTs. Uh, and the compare from the foam therapy versus endovenous ablation, uh, the durability of GSC occlusion, neurological or retinal complication with foam is reported. Okay, so uh, in a case for the varicose, we usually, we usually consider to do a phlebectomy for the great saphenous vein varices, not related to reflux, we do a sclerotherapy. For the PSP plus there is a reflux, we do a surgery. For the sclerotherapy and surgery, provide a more effective treatment than conservative. While ligation without stripping is more effective than phlebectomy alone. IFLA, RFA, and NBCA are better than surgery in regards to the quality of life and return to work. And IFLA, FRA, RFA, and NBCA are considered as an effective alternative to surgery, as safe as surgery with long-term safety support by case evidence. So this is our homework to do here in Indonesia because uh, many people think that CVI is still a cosmetic problem. We still have to educate them that varicose is not just a cosmetic problem. Varicose is a disease entity which can reduce the quality of life. Of course, prevention is better than the treatment and medicine, lack exercise, and gradual external compression stocking still is the mainstay of the treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yuan Sun Kosama, for interesting presentation. Now, for the second presentation, please, the Dr. Patel, to introduce the presenter. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is going to be Dr. Harinder Bedi. And as I introduced him, he's a very talented person. I, I would not say a skilled surgeon, but he's, he's very talented in many things that he does. So um, it goes without saying that he's a skilled surgeon, but um, he is going to talk to us about uh, uh, non uh, non-thermal ablation which I am sure is how we are going to take treatment of superficial venous reflux ahead in the next decade. And there will be more and more things that we will hear about this. So please, Dr. Bedi, the cyberspace is yours. Thank you, Malay. Uh, Vishal, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. And my slides? Uh, yes, sir. OK. So I'll be talking to you. Thank you, Dr. Malay and um, uh, our faculty from Indonesia. I'll be talking to you about the non-thermal, non-tumorism. We short form as NCNP, techniques of endovenous ablation. And the little thought about is that going to be the future of endovenous ablation. No disclosures. Salamat malam to all my colleagues. <laughs> Selamat malam too. Uh, thank you. Selamat malam. <laughs> and I welcome you to our uh, uh, virtual conference next year. We have the exact dates and the website will be uh, informed to you soon. I was quite happy that to know that Indonesia is the largest island country of the world. <laughs> I, I somehow never knew that. So it's the largest island country of the whole world. So congratulations to you. 
and I told you, Malay, about uh, the connection to Sanskrit. So the name itself of Jakarta is derived from uh, Sanskrit. Jaya which means victorious, and Krit means accomplished, which means a victorious deed or a victory, complete victory. So we have a lot in common, isn't it? Now, I have a very good uh, memories of Jakarta. These are some of my patients when I was in Sydney. This is way back, um, 1990, almost 30, 30 years back. This is another gentleman and uh, with his lovely daughters, one of whom is a neurosurgeon in uh, UK. And the next visit was uh, in um, 2001, which is 20 years back. And these are some of our colleagues from Japan. Uh, this was an international conference. And uh, after the conference, we had a nice tour. There are some lovely places in Jakarta, very beautiful places. This is one of the cafes over there. And uh, these two people, one of them is head of the department in Cleveland Clinic and the other in Mayo Clinic. And this is from Jakarta. And I have a special um, reason to be happy. I was gifted two shirts <laughs> by the, because I did two surgeries over there. And if you can see, this is the same shirt it's a 20 year old shirt. I'm still wearing it. It's a Batik shirt and it's, wow. beautiful. it's beautiful. And that's the yeah. shop which uh, probably they got it from. And uh, it lasted 20 years and I wear it not very frequently, of course. These are some of our co faculties. On my right is Dr. Jurovada, uh, the late Dr. Jurovada, who was a pioneer in uh, transplants. And these are some other faculty in Jakarta during the conference. And of course, we had Joyride's. Um, in this lovely city. So basically, uh, warm greetings from India to our faculty from Indonesia. Now we know that we are already doing thermal techniques and they're basically laser and RFA. They use very high energy, high heat, 100 degrees centigrade, irreversible damage, severe pain to some patients to, to reduce which we use to muscle anesthesia, which again means three needle pricks. And this is a study we did where we removed the vein, which was an extra vein from a CABG patient and used endovenous ablation. You can see the vein is totally destroyed, plus even the exterior of the vein. And this leads to pain, echimosis, and even nerve injury. So to overcome this, uh, this we published this, uh, this was probably the first paper on a human vein treated with endovenous ablation. This was published in 2014. So to avoid the complications or the problems of thermal ablation, these two ideas came to different people. Mechanical, chemical, there are two uh, devices, Clarivane from Utah, USA, and Febogriff from Poland, and use of cyanoacrylate glue. Again, two types, one is from USA, Cephine Vinasir, and there are a number of them from Turkey. Biolas, Vinoblock, and Venix. I have used the Vinoblock. Foam, of course, was the original non-thermal, non-tumescent technique. Unfortunately, there is, although it is a very good technique, but the results do not match the thermal. In thermal, we know there is a success rate of 95 to 99%, while in foam, it is much, much less. And there is something new on the horizon called high-intensity focused ultrasound, which I won't be talking about because that also uses thermal techniques, but it is something to know about. So this is a fantastic concept. We'll first talk of the mechanical chemical, where you combine foam with a mechanical device, which produces not just spasm of the vein, not just reduces the foam volume, which is required, but also the penetration of the foam is better because we are damaging the endothelium of the vein and causing a more intense fibrosis for better results. So that's called MOCA or MICA, that is Mechanically Enhanced Endovenous Chemical Ablation. I'll actually show you the device. Uh, this is the American one, the Clarivane, which we probably don't have, I have not used that. And it's, it's a rotating wire, which rotates at 3,500 rotations per minute. And along with that, we inject foam, so they go simultaneously. And the rotation also disperses the foam better. So this is the device. And uh, uh, there is a gun, there is a syringe for the foam, and then there is a catheter which goes in like a laser. It's not a laser, it goes in into the vein. The principle is the same that you enter the vein and you damage it 
instead of thermal technique, you have gamigated non thermal technique. So, this is the rotating uh, end of the clary vein. And when the machine is on, it actually rotates very fast, 3500 uh, times. And at the same time, we inject foam. So, you have foam. And along with that, you have uh, damaging the endothelium. So, the foam is able to penetrate, and a lesser amount of foam is able to do the job. And there are a number of trials which started in 2011, which have used the MOCA device. And basically, they should tell us that uh, the efficacy is the same, it is non inferior to thermal techniques, while at the same time, the complications of pain of echimosis of hematomas are much, much reduced. And these have been studied, very elegant studies are there, where they uh, studied the VCSS and the Aberdeen scores and the quality of life, and uh, the huge number of them. And there were hardly any complications, very low incidence, almost zero of DVT, no nerve injury, because there is no damage outside the vein, no skin injury, and some amount of bruising may be there in the initial cases was there because when you retracted the device, it caught on the uh, vein valve and ruptured it. So huge number of papers are there and you can easily access them. Most important papers were from the Netherlands, which compared, uh, uh, tried MOCA and compared it with RFA also. So this is from 2011. And then the same group published data, longer data in 2014, I've already told you the results, non-inferior to thermal with advantage of reduced complications, reduced pain, reduced pain, I'm sorry, and VCSS and quality of life scores were improved much more than in the thermal techniques. So again, uh, same group from Netherlands compared MOCA versus RFA and found excellent results. And this is the result that they got. The pain for, was much less, 18.6 in MOCA versus 14.8 in radio frequency. Return to work was 3.3 days versus 5.6. And uh, return to activity was 1.2 days compared to 2.8 days. So that's very important. Similar results in number of other trials, including this one, which uh, uh, trial was done on the short sapness or the small sapness vein. Again, very good results, very, very low incidence of the common complications of thermal injury. So that was about the American device. Second device is from Poland, which is called Flebogriff. And I've used this one. This is the end of the device. Again, the principle is the same. You go up to the septinofemoral junction, then withdraw it to three or sometimes five centimeters. And then we'll show you what is done. In the previous device, the, there was a rotation of at the end. In the phlebogriff, there are these tines, which are very sharp. Actually, when you use it and you're discarding it, if you feel it, it's actually very sharp and it can tear a glove. And these devices, the tines, will produce a damage to the endothelium of the vein from inside. And from inside that, we have another catheter through which we are injecting the foam. So this is, you can see a total disruption of the endothelium and then the foam is able to penetrate much better and do its job. So we have a short animation. Principle remains the same. Go up to SJ, SFJ, withdraw three to five centimeters. This is the time which is damaging the endothelium and we inject the foam at the same time. And again, the initial papers were from Poland and then from other countries. My first patient was in April, 2018. And uh, a patient was very happy. And uh, once you have a happy patient, uh, you know, he, he gets more patients for you. And of course, he, he got a wide uh, media coverage. And there are uh, my colleagues who have a much better or uh, bigger experience uh, in India, like Dr. Rahul Jindal. And so basically to summarize about MOCA, more than 20,000 cases have been done. Occlusion rate, non-inferior to thermal, quality of life much better. DVT in a huge series, when you compile them, was less than 0.5%. In some series, was zero, and there is absolutely no injury to the nerve. So these are the technical advantages. No tumor sense, no heat, no nerve injury, and so quicker return to activity. But we still do not have a very clear-cut standard. For example, should we use liquid or foam? 
is rotation better or cutting better? How deep should the damage be? What is the concentration ideal of the sclerosin? What is the speed of the ablation? And what about large veins? So there are some things which are still work in progress. Large veins can be tackled with the, both the devices and the advantages are as written over here. So that was about one non-thermal, non tumescent non technique. That is MOCA. The second is of glue, that is cyanoacrylate or CA for short glue. Again, we have two types, the American, which is called Vena Seal, and the Turkish glue. There are a number of them. The commoner ones are Biolas or very close, Vena Block or Invermed, which I have used, and Venex. And I'm told there are a couple of them more which are um, patented. The glue that we use is N butyl cyanoacrylate. It is not new to the human body, it has been used in various places, including the skin. So we are not worried too much about biocompatibility. And it is a liquid which the moment it comes into contact with an ionic solution, that is blood, it rapidly polymerizes and solidifies and also causes intense inflammation and hence fibrosis. So that is the way it works. And these are the two commonly used, three commonly used. This is the Vena seal, which is Medtronic, very close, which is Biolus, Turkey, Vena block environment, which is Turkey. And these are the differences in the uh, type of the glue. For the Turkish, they are uh, uh, more liquid, less viscous. The vena seal is more viscous and takes a longer time comparatively to work. And the vena block is the fastest because it is the thinnest. So vena seal was developed by Safion in USA 2011. That company was bought over by Covidian and then by Medtronic. So now it is a Medtronic. Um, uh, company which is, owns it and this is the final acrylate is the glue as I've already told you. 2011 when it started was approved in 2015. It is available in a large number of countries including Asia. Uh, we don't have Indonesia here but I'm sure it must be available now. This might be an older uh, slide. The device is fairly simple. There is a pistol like dispenser. There is a 5cc vial with the glue Glue is very expensive. There are two lure lock syringes with dispenser tips, blunt needle for removing the glue, an introducer sheet, and a 5F delivery catheter with a guide wire inside it. So that's, there is, you don't need any machine. You don't need a, a, a 10 lakh or a, a expensive device like a laser. This is just the machine. This is just the gun and the catheter which are disposable. So it, with this American Vena seal, the first dose is dispersed. Uh, you press the trigger for 30 seconds, three to five centimeters away from the SFJ, pull it back and then press for three minutes. After that, you pull it every three centimeter, every, and you, uh, you, you press for 30 seconds, then three centimeters, 30 seconds. So a little different from the second device that I'll tell you. So this is the standard method for Vena seal. So that's, that's the gun, that's the device. You have to, of course, do it under ultrasound. All endovascular procedures need ultrasound. So I have fast forwarded it. I don't do it that fast. So again, a puncher, introduce the sheath, and then introduce uh, your catheter, go up to SFJ, come back five centimeters. Then take the glue and inject the glue into the catheter, which goes over a guide wire. And then you press it and then take it back for three centimeters and then press for three minutes. After that, you have to just press for 30 seconds. The first is for three, three minutes. So that is about the Vena seal. And there are again numerous trials, which again show the same thing as before. That is a non-inferiority and lesser number of complications. The only complications seen in most of the glues are phlebitis. And that is still uh, even up to 1, 5, 15%. Incidence of DVT is very less. Second, we go to the Turkish glues. I've told you the three that I know of. There are probably a few more. And uh, it's a laser guided device. It's actually not a laser, it's just a light. And this was uh, started in 2013. Success rate is as good as any other endovascular device. 
catheter is kept three centimeter distal to SFJ. The method of pulling is a little different. We pull it at two centimeter per second, and the the pistol delivers 0.03 ml of the glue at each centimeter of the vein. So this is a little less thicker uh, die. That is why we it is fast. And as I said, glue has already been used in various parts of the body with uh, without much uh, biocompatibility problems. So that is not an issue. This is the one that I use. This is Inva Med, and that's the device. That's the gun. And that this white thing is the laser guide. This is the syringe which we fill uh, with the glue. This is the vena block, and this is the catheter which is very uh, pliable, which is very tractable, and it is a braided PTFE catheter. With a light at the end, which helps you to uh, position it. Of course, under ultrasound has to be additionally there. So that's the device. And that's the catheter which goes into the sheath. And this is the glue that you're sucking up. Let's see if we have uh, there's not much difference in the technique other than the speed in which you're pulling it. So that's the laser source. That is the catheter. Again, it is a single-use device. You do not need to buy any machine. It's a micro catheter. It generally goes in very easily. It is very trackable. And again, you go up to the SFJ, withdraw three centimeters, and then start injecting. With the Vena seal, they suggest that you withdraw five centimeters. So, little difference. So, this is the technique which I have already told you. Amount of dry, uh, amount of glue used is generally less than two ml in most, in all the cases, actually. And this is the patient, our first patient, which we have done in May 2018. So again, uh, it's good for people who are very obese, where you are, you will have a problem of compression bandages. In both of these, in all the non-thermal techniques, compression bandage is not mandatory. So if you have a thick thigh, you'll, you know you'll have a problem of bandage. So this is one good technique. Another good uh, indication is when the patient is very fussy or, you know, you want to do on the local, but he is very fussy, he will not tolerate the pain of multiple tumorcent pricks. So this is a good technique to know about it. Again, a large number of uh, trials, the E-scope trial, the WAVES trial, most of them are with the American uh, uh, glue. And uh, there's a uh, trial from uh, Europe, which had European countries, multi-center trial, Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, UK, 2011 to 2012. And they again found non-inferiority to the thermal techniques with better quality of life, lesser pain, quicker return to uh, normal activity. We close was a pivotal study by our dear Dr. Nick Morrison. And uh, this again was a multi-center prospective trial, 222 patients with very, very similar results. This is the trial by Nick Morrison. And this is the results of the B close that uh, less bruising with the glue, of course, efficacy of all these procedures, whether thermal or non-thermal, should be more than 95 to 99%, and it is. And even we have long-term results up to three years. We do not have yet published results beyond three years. And there are various comparisons of thermal and non-thermal ablation, like again with our friend, Dr. Alan Davis. Uh, these are multiple trials. They all show that the results are 97 to even 100% immediate, and then uh, at one year, two years, and three years, they're comparable to the other uh, thermal techniques. With the Turkish glue, there are not many trials. This is one of them, it's published in 2018. Huge number of patients, 525 patients, glue versus RFA versus laser. And again, they followed them for two years and the results were very similar. That is non-inferiority with lesser uh, pain and a quicker return to work. So these are these are across the countries of the results. Another uh, trial of using uh, glue in perforators, which showed a success rate of 76%. So these are two glues, two means the, the, the USA and the Turkish. So we now seen versus the three glues I told you. Uh, the device is almost similar. Differences in the glue, which is more viscous in the Vina seal, less in the Turkish. And the technique is a little bit different, not much. So to, in, lay, in simple terms, the Wiener seed is like honey, while the very close is more like water. Technique is mostly similar. Here, Wiener seed says five centimeters from saphenofemoral junction, while Turkish says three centimeters. I guess this is still work in progress. 
So the vena shield is segmental. You inject, you wait, you inject, you wait. The very close is continuous technique. Other than that, not much different. Data is there with vena shield, not too much data with very close. So I'll skip to them. And they are just the same things. Um, and some are unpublished trials, uh, which again show good results like this a very close glue versus one per seven zero laser. So what we need is longer term follow up. What is the recurrence rate? What about larger diameter veins? And we all know that blue has hypersensitivity reactions. No major anaphylaxis has been reported and causes severe phlebitis in up to 15, 1.5% of the cases. So blue is especially good for multiple regions, patients with large size, you know, active patients or patients who do not wish to wear compressions and patients who fear multiple needle sticks. So when you compare to thermal techniques, then of course, uh, thermal techniques, very good follow-up. This is shorter. Nerve injuries are there in thermal, not in th non-thermal. Patient comfort is much better in the non-thermals. So we still have a long way before we can uh, actually compare the thermal with the non-thermal techniques. Of course, I, obviously non-thermal techniques, there is no heat-induced injury. So that is a big plus. You do not need an anesthetist in the room. In some of the thermals, you might need, although we have never used general anesthesia, but you might at times need an anesthetist present. And of course, not universal, short time with the non-thermal techniques. Do not need to invest in big machines which cost an initial investment like the laser or the RFA machine. Of course, no hospitalization is there in both the cases. It is good in tortuous vessels because the catheter is very pliable. It is easier to introduce and it takes a guide wire. It is over the wire. And especially in C5, C6, where the skin is very tough near the problem areas and you cannot give uh, tumor center anesthesia, then this is, of course, ideal. And it is now a class 2A and a class 2B indication in most of the guidelines. Uh, this is something a little, I just found it, I thought I'll share it with this distinguished audience. That is a, there is a device, I have never used it, it's called a B block. This is the device, and they apparently put, there's just one paper, they put it at the SFJ so that nothing can go beyond into the deep veins. And there is just this one paper, uh, this one, which is published in 2019, which I could come off. So I thought we'll do something interesting. It is non-thermal, of course, but there is this new device which prevents embolization of uh, any glue or whatever thing you're putting in, into the deep veins. So to conclude, uh, uh, this is just to introduce my uh, state to our um, uh, Indonesian friends. This is a village called uh, Kila Raipur, which is near our city. And there are rural Olympics there every year, except for this year. And this is one of the uh, athletes. As you can see, we need to be like this athlete. We need to control both the horses. That is predictable ablation. It is not that the patient should not have pain. And that's it. That's not it. It should be predictable. It should be as good as the thermal techniques. And then the second horse, of course, it is that the patient should be comfortable. So the future is already here. It's unevenly distributed. We all know that. We are still developing countries. So in the next conference, I'll probably present to you where you can remove the vein, treat the varicose vein without even touching the patient. So again, uh, welcoming you for our virtual conference. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Malay. Terima Kasi, I was waiting for that. So Terima Kasi to my dear uh, colleagues from Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bedi, again. And, uh, you know, I when, I when I heard our Indonesian colleague show us the pictures about the legs, you know, Actually, you could actually substitute them for our Indian patients too. You, you know, the color is the same, the disease is the same, and everything is the same. So, uh, I see Dr. Devendra Deki Wadia here. So, De Deki, good evening. Is uh, Rahul uh, uh, online uh, or uh, Roy online uh, for any comments that they would like to make? Uh, uh, and uh, yes, Rahul. Rahul, I see you. So, yeah, he's, he's on the phone. Uh, Deki, yeah, please go ahead with your comment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bedi, a wonderful presentation. But uh, at the end of the presentation, 
I got confused. What to use? Because I have got in my hospital one uh, uh, laser machine, I've got the RF machine, and now you have shown such beautiful results of this non-thermal technique. So I think the cherishma of surgery or that surgeon, you know, it reduces, but uh, it appears to be a beautiful uh, techniques, few techniques one by one. And I hope we should have good trials in our country. So that was a wonderful presentation, Betty, and I congratulate you for that. Thank you. Uh, Malai, uh, I think, let us take uh, opinion or, and questions from others. I'll come yeah, back yeah, again. I I see, I see Rahul and Roy, so uh, uh, we have our panelists make some comments and then uh, uh, one after the other. So Rahul go, uh, can go in or uh, Roy can go in, so whatever. So who's, who do I see? I see Roy. Roy, what happened? Hello. Roy is, Roy is silent. Yeah. <laughs> Raul is in. Raul, come in. Raul, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm really sorry and um, uh, really enjoyed both the presentations and uh, uh, um, uh, they were really fantastic. And I, I'll just uh, ask questions and pass some comments. Here. And, uh, with, uh, Hello. Dr. Kasama. Dr. Kasama, can you hear me? If you are, you are muted, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, it's a fantastic presentation. I see you have got a very complicated case in terms of post thrombotic syndromes. And uh, yeah. most of the decks are like uh, champagne shaped bottles and a lot of venous ulcers you are seeing in your practice. And I think they are one of the most uh, uh, difficult patients to treat. And tell me something do you, uh, for the venous ulcer, do you use uh, four layer bandages and, uh, uh, and or what else you use to uh, heal them? Okay, uh, we uh, for some patient uh, we that can afford the medical stocking we use the medical stocking itself. But uh, for them who can't uh, cannot afford the medical stocking, uh, we we use the compression with the bandage. Uh, okay. I put like the six sack bandage, but not for layers. Okay, not for layers. Okay. Yeah, not for layers. So, because what our experience is that <coughs> you see any uh, any bandages if we use, uh, so they they are not able to produce a very high pressure, especially because we in our practice also we see a lot of patients with the post thrombotic syndromes and uh, such champagne shaped leg and ulcer, and when we used to apply stockings the ulcer they don't heal up fast. So uh, you can also make up uh, your four layer bandages uh, like uh, put in a simple cotton roll and then put in a non-stretch uh, crepe bandage, who, which doesn't stretch. And then on the top of that, you can use a stretchable bandage. Uh, you know, there are different crepe bandages. And you can actually make up a very cheap uh, three to four layer bandages, which provides the uh, pressure to the tune of 40 to 50 millimeter mercury. So that really uh, helps us to heal up. Second thing, what we have learned in the new, uh, in the past, like in the, just in the last few months is, uh, we use a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, things like an artificial skins, uh, dermal-based skins. So as soon as the ulcers are granulated, so we just put in an artificial-based skins there, and then we do the four-layer bandage or three-layer bandage, and we leave the bandage for six to seven days. And then we teach the patient how to do the bandage so they can keep on doing the bandages at home. And we keep on sending us the patients from very far off patients. Uh, you know, they don't have to come every six days to the hospital. So that has really helped us to uh, very fast early healing of the ulcer. Uh, you know, third, what we do is like, as soon as the ulcer is not infected, we are doing a very early ablation of the disease if required, if there are superficial veins. And uh, so I don't do open surgery at all. So, but, uh, you know, and, uh, but, you know, whatever surgery, open or endovascular, it really uh, helps us uh, a very early healing of the ulcer. But it was fantastic presentations and you had really good results of healing of the ulcers. Very nice. Thank you, Rapul. Please stop so, right here. Please, please. Start yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Dr. Bedi, um, um, amazing and, uh, you know, 
uh, talk as usual and um, you know so i think non uh, timmersons methods are uh, just a small comment is uh, is a very important method but i personally feel that uh, it is still uh, you know in our, my practice or i feel as a practice uh, i don't think it should be a standard of care like means uh, you know as dr bezi said any non timmersons method that still uh, has not reached a very high closure rates but if you look into the uh, results with the glue there are a lot of publications which is coming up now which shows that the 3 to 5 years follow up uh, of the glue is around 96 to 97% closure rate and when the same studies showed that the rf and laser had got a closure rate of 86 to 89% so means the glue closure has a higher occlusion rate on a long term follow up it's slightly uh, difficult for me to uh, digest because you know we do all the techniques and uh, in a routine fashion and i uh, really still feel that uh, moka uh, or the glue uh, should be done in a particular set of patients like uh, patients who are very needle sensitive a uh, patient who are obese where giving a tumor sense causes a pain because we do all varicose veins under local anesthesia walking procedure and um, and the patients if the you are doing in a smaller center where there are no laser and radio frequency machines are available then we can use this technique uh, otherwise i still feel that the thermal ablations uh, give you the best uh, results in terms of uh, closure rates and with the newer machines like a 1940 nanometer laser which we are oh, using nice. seven months it really gives us a good good, uh, good closure what do you think dr vedi <clears throat> yes see this is uh, still work in progress and yes. uh, we we see there are so many things we don't know what is the exact dose how you know how much uh, should it be cutting is better or there are no trials between the different methods is the turkish glue better or the other glue better then uh, uh, i have found a high incidence in my very small series of phlebitis with the glue so i am wondering whether what is your experience of phlebitis and that can be quite uh, painful sir in, i i know the short yeah it's short term. yeah i i have done like now 210 cases with glue yes. and uh, but uh, we have used only uh, one case with metronic glue and rest is all uh, turkish invermed okay. glue and um, so metronic glue is just recently available in our country uh, only two or three months back and it's very expensive it's like uh, three times the more cost of the turkish glue so that's why i am not able to use it it's that's the only reason and uh, it's not cost effective but in 210 patients uh, what we have done we actually surprisingly only three patients or four patients had aphlebitis and there is no phlebitis at all and actually talking it is less bruise uh, less phlebitis and less cord formation than even the lasers the, from that angle i am very happy uh, you know and uh, you know when you share with the guys who are using the glue in turkey who have done like 4000 patients with glue 5000 patients with glue so they also share the same experience so i don't have a huge experience but now is 3 years we have been using glue now and so we got patients coming up after 3 years follow up and uh, i am actually um, uh, happy with the glue as such except the uh, cost uh, can i can the long term can i interrupt uh, rahul can i interrupt can we can we ask dr kosama to make any comment and our indonesian host uh, uh, dedi and dr pratama to make any comments that they may have so please uh, uh indonesian uh, doctor uh, indonesian colleagues here dr kosama uh, would you like to respond to what dr uh, rahul uh, um, mentioned about your talk and then the uh, the uh, armadi and uh, uh, devi and uh, darvis for their comments please the floor is now for the indonesians please um, comments from indonesia only now thank you Okay, thank you, Dr. Rahul. Uh, I'm concerned with the four-layer bandage. I already read the report, uh, but uh, uh, do you have any trick? Because uh, I'm concerned with the obedience of the patient to use four layers. Because in our experience, I uh, we use uh, just one layers to put a thick sac for the bandage, and sometimes the patient came to uh, our 
clinic uh, without using it because oh, it's too hot here. I cannot stand it. And uh, I think if I put the four layers, the obedience rate will be reduced. Do you have any uh, experience or trick about Yes, uh, this is a very common problem. So what? that's why we teach them and we tell them every fourth day, you just remove the bandages and uh, apply uh, in coconut oil and take a bath, clean the whole wound and leave it open for a few hours and apply coconut oil and then reapply yourself because they cannot come to the hospital again and again. So that's why teach, we teach the patients or the patient attendants. And uh, so by which our compliance has really improved. And uh, now there are some patients who are very, you know, who feel very hot. So we can use the wraps. And, uh, you know, uh, wraps has also got a pressure of like 30 to 40 uh, millimeter mercury pressure. Uh, in uh, the coconut oil, it's, uh, we put, uh, we asked them to put it uh, in the ulcer too, if they yeah. have ulcer. Yeah, they, they can put in the normal dressings below. And then you can put the wrap on the top as a compression. Okay, we'll try it. Yeah, yeah. Any 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 comments from uh, Dr. Prathama and Dr. Uh, Darvish Patrinath? Uh, any any comments from uh, our Indonesian professors? Can I make a comment, Dr. Malai? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. Dr. Akmadu, please go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. A very great job. Congratulations to Manado Vascular team. Uh, I have noted that you also did non thermal ablation using uh, Penazil. Uh, when you performing the procedure, did you use Tumasan or not? Because some said that uh, uh, performing Tumasan can compress the Thin and making it less luminal volume and allow small amount of glue, giving the effective obliteration result with low complications. How about uh, your comment uh, to Dr. Yuansun and also uh, to Dr. Bedi? Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Bedi, please respond to that. I'm sorry, I missed, I couldn't understand your question. Can you just uh, repeat it in short? I'm sorry for that. Okay. Uh, when you're performing uh, non-thermal ablation, uh, some said that uh, making tumescent anesthesia give uh, some advantage, making it less luminal volume and uh, allow uh, for us giving a small amount of glue and okay, okay, okay. No, I've, I've never used uh, tumescent with any of the two techniques, mocha or with the uh, uh, glue. But your point is well taken. <laughs> if you use tumescent, you, you will compress the vein. So I presume uh, your results might be even better. But uh, it is not uh, recommended or it is not a guideline, but it is something to keep in mind. I've never used uh, tumescent with. Uh, uh, I think, I tool. think it's a, it's. It's it's a great idea, which which just keeps keep brings us to the point that we still haven't heard the last word on this. Yes, Dr. Sir. Pratama, any any comments that you have? Uh, how about high ligation? Is it really needed in uh, endovenous procedure or not? Because when I come to uh, Korea, they say that they always perform high ligation in uh, endovenous uh, treatment uh, to decrease the recurrence rate. How about your uh, experience? I think none of us uh, in India at least are doing that. And uh, we just, uh, the people who are practicing uh, endovenous, we do not regate. So, so far we have not. If anything, there is something called um, um, prosectomy, which Dr. Rahul Jindal is doing in which they go right up to the saphenofemoral junction. So it is like a ligation. So maybe Raul can throw some light on that, but uh, we have never uh, otherwise used surgical addition. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, in your experience, how to avoid uh, cyanoacrylate uh, spillage 
into the subcutaneous tract. Some uh, surgeon use retrograde technique by using combined technique of high ligation. Uh, they introduce the device from the groin to the uh, ankle and deliver the glue from the ankle to the upper thigh. And it also can block uh, blood from the venous return flow and give more effective result. Uh, not, not proven, not proven yet. Yes. How about it's, your comment? It's, it's a good idea and people have tried it, but it's actually not needed. It, it's very difficult to uh, get a better result than 99 to 100%. So, and you're adding a surgical procedure with maybe local or maybe some limited uh, general anesthesia. So uh, I don't think it's a good idea. Dr. Pratama. Dr. Pratama, can you hear me? <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dr. Bedi. Yes. Thank Dr. You. Pratama, any comments? Okay, thank you for the presentation. To I want to ask to Dr. Bedi, how do you think about uh, should we approach a higher cost associated with minimal invasive venous intervention? Do you think we should keep open surgery as a first choice of invasive treatment for CVI as it has been shown to be highly cost-effective. You mean open surgery versus yeah. endovenous? Yeah. Well, well, uh, cost-effective depends on the institute where you're working. Mm -hmm. In most centers in India now, we have, uh, most of us, not all of us, have, have uh, probably not done open procedure in the last three, four years. So we would not uh, um, advise an open procedure unless there are some very specific indications. Mm -hmm. Or the, actually the cost, sometimes um, uh, we must be frank with you, we do reuse the laser. So the cost is not as bad as if we were using a new, new laser every time. So you can reuse using special precautions, universal precautions. So open is out as far as most of us are concerned. Dr. Darvis, are you there? Dr. Darvis. Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, we we yeah. we are eager to hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you, Dr. Malai. Uh, thank you for join meeting. Nice meeting for us to know about the advance uh, of management of venous in India. I want to ask uh, to you and soon. You. <coughs> You did more open surgery for your case. What is your consideration? Why didn't you do more uh, minimal invasive procedure like with glue or endovenous laser? What is your consideration? Okay. Uh, the first uh, consideration is the cost efficiency. And the second one, uh, because our hospital here is a teaching hospital, so we have to teach our general surgeon so they could do the stripping because it's one of their competency. So uh, for like uh, the last years, we try to divide it 50-50 for the patients who go with the endovenous and go with the open one. And uh, the second, um, uh, the third reason is uh, we try to evaluate the venous condition first. Uh, if it is very tortoise and we are not so sure where uh, the wire with the endovenous uh, could go through there, so we still consider to do the open surgery. Dr. Bedi. Yes. You, you, you just and been... She, uh -huh. You, you just be, uh, you know, move from a teaching institute. Yeah. Uh, I would like to be the devil's advocate and just say that, is it even necessary now with the other skills that the way we teach surgeons or what we teach to our surgeons, is it even necessary to do this as an operation to teach residents? What is your take, Dr. Darvis and Dr. Bedi? Please respond to that. See, it is, um, it is a fact now that open surgery is going out. 
just like SEPS for perforators, you know, we used to, so all of us must have at some time put in a scope and uh, located the perforator and ligated or clipped it. But that is not being done at all, at all. It is zero now. Similarly, when my next generation, which means the students, when they're going into practice, then open surgery will not be there, unfortunately. So, but I agree with you that one should train, at least one should know how to do the open surgery. So if once in a while I do an open surgery, I make sure that whoever is free does come in, uh, into the OT and see it. But I, I foresee that it is slowly going to be phased out. Dr. Darvis, what, what is your uh, take on this? Because, you yeah. know, I mean, there, there are many other places where our residents can be taught surgical skills on how to dissect a uh, saphenous vein or the saphenofemoral junction. So do you think that we are just trying to um, go against the tide or we are just trying to make this a point and probably in future, we don't need to teach our residents this skill or this specific operation. What do you think, Dr. Darvis? What is the uh, take or what is the trend in Indonesia? <coughs> okay. In Indonesia, for general surgeon, we didn't teach him with uh, ultrasonography. So they, they didn't know about how to use ultrasonography. This ah, is okay. the basic, yeah, this is the basic problem for them to, to use another procedure. Yeah. So we only teach them with uh, open surgery procedure. Only that uh, one kind treatment of uh, varicose vein for them. I think, I think this, this is a great message. Uh, for all of us that uh, if we really do want certain uh, surgeries um, or, or we want to teach our residents to be more and more less, I mean, so, so to be less invasive, then we yeah. have to teach them additional skills. This, yeah, is, yeah. A, this is a big, uh, big point. Yes, baby. Yes. Yeah. See, there is another uh, uh, side to the story that with, all of us, you know, we, uh, even in the lay public, we propagate that, you know, non-surgical intervention, endovascular. And so sometimes the patient comes and we feel that, no, maybe I should do an open surgery. But the patient refuses. He says, I don't want an open surgery. I want the laser surgery. They just know laser, whether it is, you know, it may be non-thermal, but they know laser. So this is another problem. And if you don't do it in the private, then he'll probably go to your competitor and get it done. So slowly, slowly, because of us, maybe we have propagated endovascular so much that even the patients uh, want it, they ask for it. So that is another point we must uh, think of. So that, that's, 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 I think, I think that's the, uh, there, there, there's a great message here saying that, uh, yes, we, we do have to go ahead uh, or go along with the flow, but, uh, teaching our surgical residents special skills like ultrasound. You know, it could help in abdominal surgery. It could help in anything that our residents do. You know, ultrasound is becoming so helpful for anything that we do. So uh, with that, I think uh, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, we can... Uh, um, Yes, 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 baby. I, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, acknowledge the presence of my uh, colleague when we, we work together in uh, Australia, that is Dr. Philip Raja, and he comes from a place very close to uh, Indonesia, that is Malaysia, uh, and he's from Sarawak. So he was kind enough and interested enough to join us, and I welcome Dr. Raja. He has recently been given the title of Kato, and uh, Dato, Dato, D-A-T-O which is the highest civilian award in Malaysia. So it's good that people are getting interested in vascular and venous surgery. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Pratama, Darvis, Akmadu, and Kosama, on all our Indonesian friends and colleagues who have joined us, of course, needless. I mean, goes without saying that all the other colleagues that who have joined us and uh, Takahiro Imai, I see him from, uh, from Japan, has joined us. 
and this is I and consider as a great beginning for all of us to learn from each other. So everybody have a good evening and let us see how things make progress and be, be hearing from each other. Okay.